notice that we have here two drawings of the same design. Um, you'll also notice that the one on the left appears to be much more complex than the one on the right. And the reason for that is that I've already analyzed the one on the left. I already have the numbering sequence down and notations that refer specifically to how I want to blast this piece. These are done in different colors and with different kinds of symbols so that I know exactly how I want to treat this piece once I get it into the blaster. Now, I'm going to go to the one on the right to show you how that is done because it's a little confusing to look at one that's already finished. Now, you have to realize that the drawing is merely a design until you analyze it. Once you analyze it, it becomes a roadmap for how you're going to blast the piece. Now, you have to develop your own signs and symbols along the way to instruct you how you want to blast it. For instance, in this area, you see that for the first time we have some lines that terminate um, in the middle of a design. They do not terminate at another line. Now, that is what we call the disappearing line, and it requires a special technique in the blaster. The way that we notate what we're going to do with that is to take a pen of a different color, in this case red. I'm going to draw a line across that. And then I'm going to draw a dotted line that terminates the black line that stopped in the middle of the design. I'll do the same thing over here. Draw a dotted line that terminates somewhere at the edge of the design. Now that is to indicate to me that I will go ahead and cut with the stencil knife both of these lines so when I get to these areas to be blasted, I will remove the entire area. However, I will not blast the area with the dotted line, and I will stop blasting where the red line crosses the terminated black line. Now, to continue the numbering sequence, the area on the leftmost part of the cliff is going to be the one blasted first because it overlaps on the other two areas. I will number that a number one. And then you notice the little shrubbery that we have indicated up here is also on top of the second area. Now I'm going to have to use that as my second step. And I'm going to indicate the areas to be blasted by arrows. And that's because these are too small to write numbers inside of. Now <clears throat> the cliff behind the shrubbery then becomes your number three. And the section of the cliff that is behind the number three, of course, would be your number four. The shrubbery on each of the cliffs number three and number four could be blasted at the same time and indicated by number five. Now we're ready to proceed with the rest of the design. You'll notice that we have some more disappearing lines in the branch of the tree. So we're going to indicate in the same fashion with dotted line indicating where the cut line is going and a crossed line indicating where the blasting will stop. Now we can continue numbering this and analyzing it in the fashion that I've explained to you before. And you can get most of the lower part of this numbered as it is on the other design. However, when you get to the upper area here, you're going to find that you've got another problem. And this is, requires another one of the advanced blasting techniques. Here you have two elements of a tree, a thick branch and a thin branch. They intersect two or three different times. Now, the first time they intersect, the thick branch is on top of the thin branch. And the second time, the thin branch is on top of the thick branch. If you were to peel the thick branch first, it would be fine at the first intersection, but at the second intersection, it would be out of sequence. Now, the way that you indicate how to handle that is there again to change color of your pen and your notation. And I'm going to draw a wavy line across the trunk, across this branch, between the area that's on top of the thin branch and where the thin branch is on top of it. I also indicate by the use of an arrow the fact that this is going to be peeled all at one time up to the wavy line. And then I'm going to stop peeling it until I blast the top layer. Now, this is very confusing at this time. Don't try to understand it until you see it in the blasting cabinet actually happening. I'll continue 
with making notations according to the design that I already have analyzed to show you just exactly how the roadmap should go to tell you what you're going to do in your blasting sequence. Now this is not the order that I would analyze this design. In fact, analyzing this design takes a considerable amount of time and it's best done with a pencil because you're going to change your mind several times. I just want to show you here how I go about notating the different techniques to achieve these effects. Now this is what you call interweaving elements and you find these quite frequently in natural uh, representations of natural things like trees, um, uh, hair that um, overlaps or that intertwines itself, horses' manes, things like that, you'll find this type of a, an effect. And it requires a, sp a special blasting technique that I'll show you in just a few minutes. Now the rest of this design is pretty straightforward in the way that it's treated. Each element has to be analyzed in relationship to the elements that touch it, and the one that's blasted first is the one that's on top of the other elements. Um, and now we're ready to go into the blast room, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Now I have this in the blasting cabinet. I've already peeled the number one areas in the sequence of blasting. And I mentioned to you before that it's faster if you peel and blast all of the areas that can be blasted at the same time. Uh, but for the purposes of the videotape, uh, it'll be faster if I just show you blasting the areas uh, of special interest for the advanced techniques. For instance, the disappearing lines that I mentioned to you before. Now, since I normally grip the glass in the area that I have to blast on this particular piece, I'm going to turn it over so that I have a better angle to blast from. I'm going to turn on the blaster. And in this case, since it's such a broad area that I'm going to blast, I have the pressure up to about 50 pounds, which is normally the most that you'd ever want to blast in a cabinet like this with a pressure blaster. I've adjusted the grit. And I'm starting to blast the area. Now you'll notice I am avoiding the area that has the red dotted line because I do not want to blast that area because that's where the line disappears. I'm going to concentrate the blast from the nozzle at the edge of the exposed area of glass and deepen that area to about halfway through the glass. I don't try to evenly carve the area out, this entire area that's exposed, just because it would take so long to do it. If you feather in the depth from the edge to the center, it's difficult to tell whether it's been carved or not, and it will definitely save you a lot of time. As you can see, as the shadows lengthen on the edges here, that indicates that the Sandblaster is getting deeper and deeper into the glass. And there again, my own shorthand on this little road map of how to blast this piece with these red dotted lines reminds me not to blast down in that area, even though the resist is peeled in that area. Now sometimes if you're not sure exactly how deep you're going, you can stop blasting, tilt the uh, piece to the side and have a little bit better look at the area. This is not quite as deep yet as I'd like for it to be. I'm going to go back in and concentrate again on the edge, deepening out that area. So there'll be plenty of contrast between this and the next stage. Okay, when that is as deep as I'd like for it to be, I'm going to turn the blaster off and peel the next area. <clears throat> In this case, the next area are the small uh, branches that are right here above the cliff, and I'm going to have to take this out of the cabinet in order to peel them. So I'll peel those and be right back to black.